This court is called into session. How do you feel if you are the one sitting on trial as those words are spoken? Even if you're innocent, is there some fear that stirs in you somewhere if you would hear those words and you're the one sitting on trial? If you answered, probably yeah, then I think we can all understand why. Judges and juries aren't perfect. And even when they try their best, there have been cases where they've given an innocent person a wrong verdict. That scenario, sitting on trial for something, you even sitting on trial, I, I don't think it's something many of us here have, have been through. Maybe none of us. So while you might be able to understand the apprehension that an innocent person would feel if they were sitting on trial, you haven't walked in those shoes. But you probably still have been through the experience of being unfairly judged by someone. Or at least feeling that uncertainty of of not knowing how people are going to judge you, fairly or not. Maybe it was a, a judgment coming from a friend, or coming from a boss. A judgment coming from passers-by on the street, or a judgment from a circle of, of co-workers, or a group of classmates. People can carry around a lot of emotional baggage from being judged unfair or in a biased way. I wonder if that's the reason why one young lady put a tattoo on the back of her neck and what it simply said was, no one can judge me. There are many uninformed and ignorant judgments leveled in our world, yeah? And so you can understand then where it comes from when people have a general distaste for judgments rendered by people. Here's a couple others that I ran into. Judge me when you're perfect. And don't judge me until you know me. Here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that there should be no judgment. I'm not campaigning for the, the very popular ideas in our world today, but very errant ideas like, well, no one knows what truth is, so you should be able to decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong, and I should be able to decide for myself what's right and what's wrong. We just can't judge that kind of thing. No, that's not correct. Right here, God gives us absolute truth. He tells us what is right and what is wrong. So, even if you faced unfair judgment in life, or very harsh judgment in life, that, that no one can judge me statement, that that just doesn't hold up. Now, the other two quotes that I put up here, however, they are true if taken in the right sense. Especially if you connect them with our theme for this Sunday as we look at the topic of the final judgment by our God. Judge me when you are perfect? He is. Don't judge me until you know me? He does. He has the right. He has the power. And in the end, he will judge all people. So let's get off the table the question of if we are going to be judged. We will. And now, let's talk about God as judge. The facts are straightforward. First, we hear in, in our verses, God's 
judgment is right. And so, you know, all apprehension about getting a wrong verdict, it's gone. Because our perfect God is the judge on the last day. But we've got to know more than that in order to have comfort. Because in these verses we have two groups described, and we have two very different judgments described for us. In verse 5, one group is described as the ones who are counted worthy of the kingdom of God. The other group, now in verses 8 and 9, is described like this, those whom God will punish with everlasting destruction and shut out from his presence. So what separates the two groups? Because in order to have comfort, you and I want to know that we are the ones who, to whom God will give a place and welcome into his eternal kingdom. In other words, who is counted worthy of the kingdom of God? What's the basis? Well, we hear a further description of, of that first group, but it comes way at the end of the verses, at verse 10. We hear this added description that goes with those counted worthy of the kingdom of God. They are his holy people, God's holy people. And then this description is immediately attached. All those who have believed, namely those who have believed the testimony right here from God given through the, the prophets and the apostles. The, the truth that Jesus is the rescuer from sin and the one to place your trust in. So you see the description, holy people, but right away you get the explanation of who is holy. The one characteristic that's put down there is this. Those who believe. That is, those who place their trust in Jesus work for us as their way into God's kingdom. If we are to take a step back and look at our own record in life. The case against us is cut and dry. You might never have committed perjury in a court of law. But which one of us has spoken nothing but the truth? Spoken nothing but the truth in life to our parents, or to our friends, or to our family members. You see, we're all guilty before our God. I may not be guilty and found guilty in a court of law of, of pushing drugs, dealing harmful drugs to others. I don't have that on my conscience. I don't have that on my hands. You in the same boat? But which one of us is not guilty of ever pushing anything harmful on others? In the words like, selfish and bitter words that we speak, and in our actions or our lack of actions that have left other people hurting in the wake. We are all guilty of sin before our holy God. So it's clear, we aren't worthy of the kingdom of God based on the record of our own life. We only deserve actually separation from a holy God. Look again to the one thing that describes this group who are holy. It is all those who have believed. It's those who put their trust not in their own record in life, but in Jesus' record. To being judged by His perfect life and His shouldering of sin and its punishment in our place. That alone makes us holy. Think of the comfort of knowing this truth. That the one who suffered, who lived, who suffered, who died, and who rose again for us, is the very one who will judge us on the last day. Our Lord Jesus knows the sentence for sin has been paid in full. He still in his glorified body bears the marks in his hands and his feet and his side. Our Lord knows the facts. 
And when he comes on the last day, God will be just and declare all who trust in Jesus free. Free to enter eternal life with him. Now, shift and look at the other group. And as we do that, do it with this, quest, this question in view. What benefit is there for us from hearing this other verdict that God gives? For the other group spoken up here, listen to the, the judgment again, verses 8 and 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not listen to the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. We're told they don't know God. And someone asks, but why is that? It's explained in the next description. I'll put it up here for you so you see it in front of you. They don't know God. And you might have heard me using a, a different word in there than what's printed in the English translation in front of us. I did that for a reason. It's helpful to know that the, the Greek word that the English translation translates as obey there, its most basic meaning, its first meaning is to listen. That's what I used. And so one example of children listening to their parents is to obey them. But the most basic meaning of the word is to listen. So in that, you get the explanation of, of why people don't know God in the end. And why they receive the judgment of, apart from God, forever in the end. It's because they do not listen to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they don't put their trust in Jesus as the rescue. And so they miss out on the only rescue from sin and its guilt. And that means, in the end, God has to give them the judgment. Your sin is still on your record, and so, apart from me, forever. And that means they suffer in eternity. Sadness and despair, unending. They will be shut out from the presence of our Lord and from the presence of His glory. That's how majesty is literally. The the glory of his power. Make sure you understand. This isn't because they don't have any interest in glory. They just listen to the wrong authors. They chase after faulty means and ways to glory. This is where we gain important warning and encouragement for ourselves from hearing this verdict of our God. There are false offers of glory from our world, and we want to be alert to them so that we don't follow the deception that they present. The devil himself came to Jesus and offered false glory. You remember that? He took him up to a mountain, a high peak. He showed him the kingdoms of the world, and he said, all this and all its glory is yours if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus saw through his lie that all the power and the prestige and the pleasure of the world is faulty because it doesn't last. The big challenge we face each day is that faulty false glory is in our face all the time because it's wrapped up in what we, we see here in this fallen world. Put that fact together with what we hear about in our verses, that in this world we face a lot of trouble. And it's specifically, we sometimes face trouble for holding to Christ Jesus and holding on to his truth. And that's important to note so that we're warned to be on our guard, to not be pulled away by the false and, and tempting pleasures of the world that are short-lived to not get off track from the one thing that really has lasting value. Don't let opposition or trouble in this fallen world lead you away from the one thing that matters in the last judgment. Hold on to your faith in Christ, which brings with it God's guarantee of eternal joy and glory. 
with that in view, I want to, I want you to think back to that young lady I told you about with the tattoo on the back of her, well, I shouldn't give away where it's at, but the tattoo, you remember the tattoo? No one can judge me. And do you remember the place where she had put it? Yeah, the back of her, her neck. I think with just a, a few slight changes, we can actually take this and, and make it into a reminder for us of the truths and the comfort that we, we gain from God's Word today. No one but Jesus can and will judge me in the end. He will give the verdict where I spend eternity. That's God's truth. Acts 17.31 puts it like this. God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. You hear who that is? That's Jesus. What a helpful encouragement and comfort to us, the Christian, to be reminded, no one but Jesus can, no one but Jesus will judge me in the end. This truth comes in handy, especially when the devil throws your sin in your face. He comes and presses his case against you with his accusations. He reminds you of your sin. He says, God could never love you. You are without hope now. Think about this. Though Satan acts as if he is prosecutor and judge and jury, that's not the case. In reality, we have Jesus as our defense attorney. And Jesus is our judge. Not Satan, even though Satan presses his case. Our triune God is the only judge and jury in this divine court. And the devil has no ground to object to his ruling. This one is mine, says the Lord. Through faith, I have made him, I have made her holy. Their sin has been taken away. Their guilt is removed. Now, rather than placing that kind of reminder on the back of your neck in a tattoo, maybe this would be good to have in front of us on a regular basis. You don't need a tattoo to do that. All you need is a Bible open in front of you regularly. Jesus, Keep me confident of what you have done for me, trusting in your record in my behalf, your perfect life, and your shouldering of my sin and its guilt, so that I can always look forward to the last day with peace, knowing that you will return to judge the living and the dead, and to give eternal life to me and all who believe in you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.